it's pretty overwhelming to think about like, you know, where you would start with something like this. So like Chuck mentioned, I'm going to build very quickly from you don't need any math background or anything like that to understand what we're talking about. And we're going to progress and progress. Uh, as always, please use the chat box. Um, I'll do my best to look. It's kind of hard to do both at the same time, but um, yeah, engage in there and we'll have a good time. So um, who am I and why should you listen to me about math? Um, I was a math and science major. I graduated top of my class at South Carolina and I won two department awards. I don't really think of that as like bragging per se. It's like kind of like bragging that you can dunk on a nine foot hoop. South Carolina was kind of like meh. There was like 12 people in my department. So kind of won um, by default there. I, uh, I worked a lot of analytics jobs. I worked at Bank of America and then I moved into um, derivatives trading, which is like pretty um, notorious for its difficulty of getting into. Um, and as Tarek said, data science is probably the most lucrative financially in terms of possible careers. Um, so yeah, I rounded out my career by joining here and working on a nonprofit, which is probably a financial uh, error by me, but um, it's been worth it so far. So I say all that because I think it's really important when um, you listen to a speaker, you have to understand their, their bias. And I care too much about mathematics. I read, I, again, I was a math and science major. I read uh, mathematical history books. I think they're fascinating. I, I have a patent in a few machine learning processes. Um, there are people who don't, don't know anything about math and they're fine. And um, there are people who know more about math and statistics than I do. And, you know, whatever, I'm not worse off because of it. Um, it's really not a competition. I am, at the end of the day, some dude. And you'll see that people who have uh, a non-advanced mathematical background can still use a lot of data, data and analytics tools um, to help inform themselves and make better decisions, even if they don't understand the theory underneath all of it. So I don't want this talk to go over your head and you feel like math is not accessible to you for the rest of your life. Um, it's, uh, it's not about how much you can understand the theoretical stuff. It's just practicing it, trying to understand what it means to you and then using it to make decisions. Um, okay. Uh, okay. There's a lot of cookie monster jokes in the chat. I'm going to pretend, I'm going to guess there's no questions and keep it moving. So, uh, I kind of want to have people unmute themselves and, and hear a few volunteers here. Uh, math is stupid. I was a TA for uh, three years in calculus. I've heard this more than anything I've probably ever heard in my life. When am I going to need to know this in the real world? Um, my first response to this is like, this, is, this isn't the matrix. Um, this is the real world. <laughs> People are asking you to, to know this, understand this, um, and getting graded on it. But um, does someone want to, if you feel like math is stupid, tell me why. If you feel like math isn't stupid, tell me why. So math is not stupid. Uh, I don't, I'm gonna guess, was that Sherman who blurted out? Yeah, that was me. I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, Sherman, why is math not stupid? Well, math is not stupid because majority of our jobs, we need math. Even if you need something like basic counting of money if you wanna work at somewhere like Publix, be a cashier, or maybe you need something like calculus, calculative or need something like a stretch of math if you try to build buildings. Math isn't stupid. Math is fundamental because if we don't have it, most of, most of the time we can't get jobs even from the most simplest of stuff. Anyone else? I mean, I, I feel like math isn't stupid like, to like a certain extent. Fine. Like right now I'm in pre-calculus and some of the stuff, it's like, do I really need to know how to graph a sine wave or like the equation for a hypo hyperbola? I think that's what it is. But like, I don't feel like I'm ever going to use that kind of stuff in the real world. But like basic algebra, I think is definitely like, you need to know that kind of stuff. Okay. 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 So math is a universal language, right? Regardless of where you come from or what you look like, everyone knows math. If aliens ever come to earth, we can talk to them with math because math is universal. It's just, it's a law of, of the, of nature and you can't change math. Okay. All right. I saw someone in the chat. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm sure people are less eager to voice this. So I'll read some of these. Um, math isn't stupid. I just find it extremely frustrating. That is probably the most honest answer so far. I really appreciate that, Rachel. Um, schools need math teachers. So math is stupid. Math is stupid because we learned so many formulas we never knew, use. 
instead of isolating what is needed, we get taught everything and struggle. Okay, okay, I understand some of the frustration in there. I think um, math is only seen as stupid because the teaching. I don't think it's necessarily the formulas or any of that in and of itself. I think it's more the teacher and boils down to that. Because if you try to teach a subject no one could care less about or, in, or not even present it in an exciting way, no one wants to learn it. No one will want to continue learning it or anything like that. Because if you just start stating facts without, you know, trying to pump it up a little, you ain't going to get anywhere into their thick skulls. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually tend to agree with that. Um, so let me start with the obvious thing that I encourage anyone who is learning something to continue learning that something, whatever it is. If, if you're really interested in learning the piano, keep learning the piano, even if it doesn't have a practical outcome for you. Um, what every psychologist can see in the brain is that, and this sounds dumb to say it, learning makes you smarter. Your capacity to learn a subject increases the gray matter in your brain, which increases your propensity to learn new material and absorb new things when applicable, right? So learning anything is not an irrelevant behavior, even if you don't keep the subject matter and you don't use it again. Um, if, it attends, if it turns into something that you actually do apply on your day-to-day -day basis, great. If not, it's not a loss of your time and effort. Um, on top of that, someone made the point that I'm going to make, um, my point number two here, math is an interesting subject taught by boring people. I'll be the first one to say it. My math teachers were, oh my God, it was awful. Um, I had one professor who was really good and I literally took him for half of my statistics classes because it was the only one that was bearable. So I ask you for the sake of the rest of this lecture, um, if you have bad experiences with math in the past, uh, this is going to be a little bit more, um, this is definitely going to be a lot different, but a little bit more engaging in terms of the subject matter. It's going to be very applicable. We'll use real life examples of things that maybe you're curious about, or you can see how it could apply to other um, things in the future. And um, I always love the math is stupid thing because um, I think I can make a pretty captivating argument for why math is interesting in less than a minute. Okay. Um, does anyone know what a prime number is? Yes. It is uh, a Ethan number is a prime is. number. So a prime number is a number that can only be divided by itself and one evenly. Okay. Ethan, that is a perfect example. Ethan, what is the largest prime number you know? Like 71. I don't know. That's not very high, but. Okay. No, no. That was, that was much better than I was expecting. Okay, Ethan, let me ask you another question. If I gave you a random number, how long would it take you to figure out if that number was prime or not? Is the number 7,146 prime or not? Um, it I'm pretty is. sure it's not. Because it's, it's divisible not. like this. Yeah. yeah. What about 7,147? Is that prime or not? Uh, I don't think it is, but I okay. could be wrong. I know just because of a trick that um, if you add up the, all the digits of that number, they add up to 18, which is divisible by three, which means the number is divisible by three. But the lesson learned from an uh, example like this is that actually if you were really good and you were so good at uh, under, understanding whether a, no, a number was prime or not, that you could do it instantly for any number in the world, um, you would win the Nobel Prize immediately. You would basically be a millionaire in two seconds and um, the basis of all cybersecurity, all cryptography and stuff like that would be um, destroyed. And every piece of information in the world would be available to you. You would have access to nuclear codes, personal information. Um, I, this is my own personal philosophy at this point. I think it's such a valuable tool that you would be killed by the NSA or the Russian government or something instantly before it's ever found out. That being said, um, I don't want to get into a conspiracy theory thing, but um, Again, math is not a dumb subject. It is a very complicated subject that people maybe lose interest in because they're not lured in with the carrot, right? I think that's a pretty, I, I think I could convince you to go learn more about prime numbers pretty convincingly um, after hearing that quick tangent, right? Um, and I'm sure someone's gonna Google some stuff about prime numbers after this. This is not a lecture on prime numbers. We'll get back to that later. Um, I wanna talk about data anal uh, analytics, um, which fundamentally is more around modeling so modeling, if, does anyone know what this is a picture of, anyone? Zoolander. Zoolander, Ethan, two for two. Appreciate you, Ethan. Um, okay, so um, question of the group, what is modeling? This is what I stole from the internet. 
It's devising a mathematical representation of a phenomenon or system. What is, what is modeling? Are we speaking just the uh, mathematical term? Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, then I'm out of this. It's like graphing, I think. Okay, graphing. Um, in n dimension, I will say that could be true. Um, other takers? Is it like um, making a, oh. an equation for something? I'm sorry, who, I couldn't see who was speaking. I saw Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah, were you saying something? Yeah, isn't it like making an equation to represent a formula or something like that? All right, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, um, we'll stick with that for now, okay? Um, modeling can be some type of equation that suggests some type of insight into um, something we're trying to understand or some natural observation or occurrence of activity that we're trying to better um, guess what is going to happen on. So before we get into modeling, um, this sounds dumb, but like literally the first um, day of statistics and when I was in South Carolina, um, my professor mentioned the matrix and was like, this is my favorite movie. And uh, it really is the most applicable thing I've understood in my life to really describe what it is to be a statistician. So does anyone know who this, who this character on this slide is? She's the, the oracle. oracle. Okay. Okay. So um, what's the significance of the Oracle and the matrix? She is able to tell uh Basically, she knows a lot more than everybody else in the Matrix, and she guides Neo on his journey. Ethan, you're doing the lecture for me so far. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, so, so the Oracle in the movie The Matrix is basically the only person who knows the truth. Everyone else is going through their lives trying to understand what truth is, observe what the things are, are happening to them, and make judgments based on those truths, right? She has the famous thing about, like, don't worry about that lamp. He knocks over the lamp. And then she asked the question, would you have knocked out the lamp? Yes or no? This is actually very applicable to statistics. When you first learn mathematics and statistics, you learn about population variances and biases and, and sample points. The population is essentially the truth, right? What are the actual parameters? We'll never know those things. Only the Oracle will know those things. Um, we can only observe things. So in the, in the sake of when you're listening to statisticians, right, like you will hear them talk about sample variances and sample point estimates. That's when they actually measure things and then they do stuff like what we'll get into later about modeling those things, um, bootstrapping to build out more data sets, um, and then using machine learning on some of that stuff to get more insights off of small pieces of, of, of sample versus population. So multiple times throughout this talk, I'm gonna mention the Oracle and about how we don't know, we're guessing, and the Oracle is the only person who knows something. So when it comes to modeling, and this is again, just some dude talking about this, um, I would define modeling as um, it helps people inform decisions by using data, right? So it doesn't tell them the truth. It doesn't tell them what the right answer is. It just helps bring some observations into their perspective. So you observe something, you measure it, and then you convince yourself that next time a similar event occurs, it will also produce a similar outcome. Hopefully in that sentence alone, you can understand the huge slippery slope that's going on here, right? There's big assumptions in that. You convince yourself that next time a similar event occurs, it will also produce a similar outcome. Let me use the easiest scenario in the book. Let's say I'm 12 years old and I have a seven year old brother. Um, we play video games. I kick the shit out of my brother in every video game we play. Um, between the ages of 12 and 18, before I, I leave the house, we play every day and he's never beaten me in a single game. I go off, I go to college, I stop playing video games, he develops more, and then I'm trying to predict if next time I go to see my brother, if he'll beat me in a game or not, right? In any of those examples, I can use the data to suggest that, okay, historically I've always beaten him, but now there's huge differences in the actual circumstances and the scenarios, right? My sample doesn't actually give me insight into what's gonna happen, and if I think that I'm gonna win, I'm probably unlikely because I haven't been playing and he has, right? Those are, that's the most obvious example of something like that where a model is not useful at all. So if you haven't been paying attention at all, I want you to remember one thing about this entire conversation, okay? And this is, this is the piece, right? If you only remember one thing about this lecture, here it is. All models are wrong, some models are useful. Does someone wanna give me an interpretation of why um, that statement is, is, is powerful or why I was um, looking to highlight it? Um, it is uh, powerful or you need to highlight it because just 
because a model shows something doesn't mean that is necessarily going to be true, like uh, hurricane models or things like that. They might show that it's going to hit the coast or something, but nobody actually really knows. They're just predicting that that is one outcome. You should just base your information off multiple different tests and multiple different models and then come to a conclusion on your own. Sure. Um, anyone else? I, I do want to, I'll take two more um, responses. Well, um, we could say like how Ethan was saying with hurricanes, we could say the same thing with population. Because I remember, it goes with what I'm saying, but a little bit, um, I was watching a video where it says something about like something which is called the population bomb. Whereas if we have more and more people, our population would get bigger and it would try to hurt us. But as the years go by, the dude was wrong. Actually, we're losing a lot of people. Even, even when the coronavirus wasn't attacking us, our population was growing steadily and steadily decreasing. So yeah, what you said with statistics, not everything is right, but we have to make sure we use enough information sources to get things correct. Okay, uh, one more. I'll read some of the things in the chat because I actually like some of these, so I'll, I'll bring this up. Um, it never, uh, I'm gonna guess this is a bold emphasis, it never perfectly, it's never perfectly accurate, but it can generate a trend. There are too many variables that can be missed for one event to happen. Those are both really good sentiments. Um, there's a conversation here about outliers. Um, I'll say they out, even if it has no outliers, things are also inaccurate. So uh, one more response and I'll kind of respond to this myself. This is sort of like the news in a sense, I would say, because you can get some information from the news and then it could be completely false or fabricated. Was this Gabriel? Was, yes. Uh, but this is the best thing I got <laughs> from this, in my opinion. Gee, no, no, this is not where I was going. There's a difference between journalism and modeling. I will, I will be the first to say that I have been, um, thanks to Tarek, on the, the wrong end of some news articles that were, in my eyes, fabricated. Um, um, but yeah, I'll, 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 I appreciate the sentiment, right? Like Don't people, go down are, this path. <laughs> people are fallible and make mistakes is, is included in the idea of like modeling not always being right. There are assumptions that are made in models and they're made by humans. And even though we use technology, um, there are limitations to our understanding of, of whatever word is we're trying to measure, right? Um, some people talked about model fit in terms of the number of models we use. Sometimes less is more, sometimes more is better. Sometimes we don't even understand the problem until we've, we've tried to predict it and we were wrong and we look back and again, we tell ourselves, now I know more and then we find out we were wrong again. So um, especially with things like an extrapolation, which we'll, um, we'll talk about that later. But um, yeah, you'll find that no model is inherently accurate ever. Just statistically based on the definition of a model, there's an error term, so it can't. Um, I'm gonna show you one example of a model. This could be too technical some, for some people. So um, try to follow along. This is just one way of, of, of orchestrating a model. Um, but if you just get the sentiment, I think it helps you understand future analysis of, of representative point estimates and, and, and data in the, in the real world. So this is something called ordinary least squares regression. If you've ever heard of regression, um, it is a very popular form of data analysis. This is one of the least shocking data uh, points I've ever seen in my life. It's a chart on the x-axis. You can see it's a student's GPA. On the y-axis, it's their ACT score. Do I need to model the fact that higher GPAs produce higher ACT scores? Probably not. It makes common sense. But I use this because um, it gives me a good idea of what regression can look like, right? So each of these points, and uh, can you guys see my cursor as I'm like circling things? Yes? Yes. I see that on? Yes. So let's use this individual observation, this one on the 2.8, right? <clears throat> Even though this person had a GPA that was higher than these folks, it still scored lower. My model that draws a straight line would have predicted that this person would have gotten around here, let's say this is a 27. So in that example, again, even interpolating, which is predicting within my uh, interval, I would have been wrong if I had just done my prediction. But we build this line by doing something called least squares regression, and I'll explain that in five seconds. Basically, it's just minimizing the distance between the point and the line, right? So I take this point, do it to the line, I subtract those two numbers, so say this is 30 and then this is 26 for ease, I'll do 30 minus 26, 
square that number, and then draw a line that minimizes the total distance of that line for everything. You don't need to worry about the theory of that. There are modeling applications out there that do that for you and calculate it. Just remember that sentiment, right? It's, in the statistics, it's called minimizing your mean square error. Basically what this is do is minimizing the distance between any point to my prediction line. We'll come back to where that's useful in other applications, but that's the essence of modeling, right? I want to be able to um, superimpose some type of prediction to best fit my data points, right? Like you always hear about model fit. So I'm fitting by, in this example, area least squares regression, which minimizes my mean square error. If you don't know what any of that means, don't worry, you don't have to. So um, now that we have that as the basis, we'll talk about some, some applications. We'll do some examples and we'll see if we can have some fun with this, right? So um, there's always a difference between probability and statistical inference. That's like an advanced thing that we won't get into, but um, point estimates need context. Let me go back to that example, right? Let's pretend I have a 3.58 GPA. What is my model? And I'm going back here. What does it say that my ACT score should be, right? It says it should be somewhere around here. So like a 31-ish. <clears throat> Again, my prediction in this sense would be 31. Statistically, it is a discrete um, variable, so I could be right, but um, it could be any number between any range. And if I don't have a variance or some type of um, interval to project that, then what does the number 31 actually mean? If it's a really wide variance, um, then actually the point estimate isn't helpful at all. Um, all that to say, you're thinking about data science in the future and like what some of these estimates mean. Context is in these things. Um, you'll hear people say we need more data, right? But we need more data. Um, the question that if you're ever working in a, in a, as a statistician, um, you'll hear people say we need more data, we need to collect more data. Some of the more impressionable people that I've met in my life and people who I regard as being great statisticians, they always ask like, what is enough data, right? In this example, if again, we go back, there's only 12 points, I think. I, I'm just eyeballing that. Um, but I can still make a, a suggestion based on an interval, right? If I actually measure like, okay, I guess that that person will have a 31 ACT score plus or minus some error term. Um, and you always hear people say that the term regress towards the mean. Um, essentially that's saying that it's going back to that trend line, right? So when things seem to be out of whack, it'll go back to what we expect, or at least that's what we hope. Um, so, so let's get into some, um, examples of model, right? So if I'm guessing no one here has like ever gone to like geico.com, maybe you have, but um, in there, if you're applying for car insurance, you put in some stuff and you say, hey, this is my job, this is my car. And it gives you an output of like what your actual price um, for your monthly payment is. That's modeling. Pricing is a huge thing. I just want to note that the stock exchange is not a pricing algorithm. It is a live auction. So when people say like, oh yeah, you know, there are algorithmic trading models and stuff like that, they do not predict um, future stock prices. They react to them, but that is, um, that is neither here nor there. Um, the comment about global warming, this is not a political conversation. I'll avoid that, but that is another example of modeling. Um, my application of the Hornets in 2015, let's look at it together, all right? So I mentioned a lot, a lot of stuff about like ordinary least squares regression. And I mentioned stuff about like regressing towards the mean. I can promise you that um, in my actual application, um, it came up. One of the questions was, how do you, how do you explain, Steve, for the time, how do you explain ordinary least squares regression to uh, the head coach, Frank, um, or Steve Clifford, who's never used a computer in his life or something like that. So here's my application. Uh, this is in 2015. I kind of like cringe at this because uh, I haven't looked at this in years. But um, here you go. It, the first question was um, talk about whether the Celtics theoretically are more likely to get the first or the fifth overall pick. I'll show you my appendix. Um, here you go. Big table. Here's the probability that um, in any year they hit a certain probability point for a seed. And um, what's actually really interesting is you can see the probability of getting the number one pick is basically equally likely as getting the number five pick. So if you're interested in tanking, um, people always say like, well, why don't the Sixers get the first pick every year? And again, this is dated for 2015. The new ping pong balls are different. But what you see is that 
Actually, it's not weird at all that the Sixers got the number five pick over and over again, because why should they get the number one overall pick over and over again? Um, they're basically statistically equally likely events. So um, this helps, again, like if you're a fan of sports, this is how your sports teams think about strategy when it comes to tanking or um, drafting a certain play, or I'm sorry, trading for certain draft picks and stuff like that. Um, you can see here, I did some regression. Um, so we were just talking about regression. I did, this is a simple linear regression for one variable model for offensive rebounding percentage of his team. Um, and here's, um, pulled some stats from like the advanced analytics on NBA.com, which um, NBA.com has some dope stats. And if you're an NBA head, there's a lot there that could be interesting. So you can see like effective field goal percentage and the likelihood of that. Um, all of these things actually translating into something that uh, a model will, uh, will point out as being um, interesting or um, I, I don't want to do this in the technical terms, but basically like it ha if it has a low p-value and regression model, it suggests that, that is the uh, leader in terms of indicating for a model. So you can say, see that this one, the lowest effective field goal rate is, um, I'm sorry, the, the lowest parameter is effective field goal rate which means or would suggest that that's the thing that's more most interesting. But if I actually reduce this model, and again, this is like a semantics of model fit, um, you, would, you would expect that net rating is the most um, indicative because it literally is the difference between your score and the other team's score. <laughs> what could be more indicative of winning than the score? <laughs> so um, this is an example of a model that was totally useless because if I had followed this blindly, I would have said effective field goal percentage is more important than the score. So you kind of have to know what you're looking for, for some of this stuff. Um, blah, blah, blah. Here's some more stuff about offensive rebounding rates and how they would impact a team's uh, win probability totals over the course of the season. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're trying to get into this uh, field with data science, like actually knowing how to speak fluently to these things is really important because this is my own application for that. Um, Let's see, going back to the slideshow, I have a few more slides here. We're gonna bang through these because I'm running out of time, but I do wanna show some more examples. Um, oh, I should have started from the regular side, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, so we were supposed to talk about AI and machine learning. Um, who, wants to, who wants to take a stab at machine learning for me? Ethan. Oh, sure. So. <laughs> The best way I can describe it is a machine learning, learning program is based off a neural network that is built by a programmer to learn essentially to get better at a task over time. Okay. Okay. So, um, yes, you're teaching a computer how to help you come. So, um, in order to understand this, you need to understand what we were talking about earlier on day one with coding, right? Modeling is essentially an art form. You have to know what you're looking for and you have to go out and you have to figure out how does your model apply to certain scenarios and um, which variables have statistical significance and also make common sense. Epso facto, if you remove that common sense variable into a machine learning algorithm, it can be really dangerous if you do something called overfitting a variable that doesn't make sense. In my example, when I was talking about effective field goal percentage, definitely not being more important than the score, you could see a machine not giving a shit and going towards this simply most significant variable. So machine learning always better than um, a human? I mean, maybe. I don't know. Who am I to say? Uh, I'm just some dude. But when you get into these kinds about what does it mean to use machine learning? It's like having a um, computer do your job for you and you teaching a computer um, to kind of do the things that you're looking for. And people who are good at this um, tout its efficiency, right? Like Spotify has a machine learning algorithm at the minute. So when you like songs, it can recommend similar songs. But if anyone who's ever used Spotify knows, it's like disgustingly uh, genre specific, where if you like a white rapper, suggest other white rappers to you. <laughs> I don't know um, if Little Dicky and Eminem are the same, but they get suggested the same, right? Could you say that is an effective use of machine learning, yes or no? I don't know. Who am I to judge? Um, so let's look at some other examples of, uh, uh, I'm gonna do this really quickly. So other examples of distributions, you can see um, this is actually from my college notes. 
you can see these are some um, R outputs, R as a statistical package um, of some distributions that are pretty common, binomial, geometric. Um, you guys are probably familiar with those discrete variables if you've ever taken a probability course and things like uniform, normal, uh, gamma, exponential. These are, again, if we're going back to the Oracle, these are population fits. So if we look at um, an example, like I was doing earlier with the multiple linear regression, um, let's just do a basic example of this and I'll, I'll seed my time because I'm going a little bit over. Um, so we did the least squares thing where we drew the line and we showed the distance away from it. Uh, this is all doing that in uh, N theoretical space or in terms of like N being your parameter fit and you're doing a bunch of matrix calculus on that. Um, you don't need to know any of this. It's just the same process where it's minimizing that um, um, distance between the line and the actual observed data. Um, familiar with string theory? Um, this is a good time to like kind of put your mind at uh, ease of what uh, end degree theoretical space looks like. But um, none of us are a theoretical physicist, so I'll, I'll stop there. But um, here's an example. Um, let's look at cheese and taste. So basically, I have three categories of things um, that are, are apparent in the cheese. It's uh, acidic concentration of acidic acid, concentration of hydrogen sulfide, and concentration of lactic acid. They measure the difference in those three things, and then they try to take a guess on um, what someone's taste score is, right? So basically, if I can think about this, I ate some cheese, I'd say this is an eight out of 10 cheese, I ate another cheese, and i say this is a six out of 10 cheese, and then um, we rank those, and we collect them and observe them, and we try to make some type of guess on the cheese. And in this example, um, you can actually see the fit of the cheese, right? Where these two things, H2S and lactic, actually are in, are statistically significant when predicting a um, taste rank, and uh, this line right here is what it looks like, right? So all that stuff about the model, where I showed you kind of the back end of it, this is the actual output. Someone in the beginning said modeling is an equation. Boom, there's an equation. You can do that for n-dimensional space, where you um, add in more independent variables. That's yeah, go get the. Chairman, I'm going to mute you. Thanks. Um, but yeah, that's an actual formula. Um, you can do that with things that are also dependent on time as well. So this is a prediction interval of a, um, the temperature of a lake over time. Um, and you can see that the prediction interval is very boring because it's going to go regress to the mean and it's just going to do what we're expected averages over time. This is something called an arena model, autoregressive integrated moving average. And um, you can see in this prediction interval where it's red, it predicts this next spot is gonna be right next to it. And then it's gonna go towards the mean and then towards the mean. And then the next few intervals, it's just gonna think that it's gonna be there, right? And it's gonna be wrong every time, but it's indicative of where it should be or where we think based on data, it, it will be. Um, I think I'm out of time to talk about this machine learning thing, but I'm just gonna use one example really quick. There's something called K nearest neighborhoods, which is a very popular machine learning technique. And I'm just gonna explain it to you visually. Um, so that way, maybe next time you hear a machine learning example, you can think to yourself, oh, actually I, I have heard that concept before and I can think holistically about this. So here's our um, really boring example again of GPA versus ACT score. Um, what if, I flip this and you, you kind of have to go on a visual tangent with me to uh, stick with this. But let's pretend we're trying to figure out, I'm going to stay on the basketball team, if someone's good at basketball. So let's pretend we're looking at 12 year olds, the YMCA, the bottom is their height in feet. So, you know, three feet to, or 2.6 feet to four feet. And the left hand side, let's say that these are some dope high school basketball players and those are their point totals, right? You got kids throwing up 36 points a game or something like that. And the, the part that's not on this graph that you can't see, because we're going to use this in the same way we did the cheese example, we're going to use those two things, height and point total, to predict their likelihood to make, um, <laughs> let's say, points as a um, varsity basketball player when they're 18, right? So six years later. So on that graph, again, just like this is show, showing, you would be able to kind of point out. But... It wouldn't make sense to just use this data. You could do a machine learning topic and follow those kids um, for the course of their careers and add in their height growth and add in 
their point totals, right? So you could see more dots being added into this. And instead, since that's a dynamic um, change, instead of following the regression line here, you would follow something called the K nearest neighborhoods where you do the average and say, I'm trying to circle these points right here. So say I had a point that landed right here, I would do the average of a, a circle around that, the K being the three, like say it's three nearest neighborhood, would be the three closest points. And I would do an average of those three to try to predict what their point total would be in the future. So machine learning does that um, because uh, they're constantly wanting to learn from new observed data. And it's a popular technique because it does um, constantly change. It's adaptive. And um, I actually did something like this at Bank of America. I got a patent for something um, doing that actual technique. So um, employers look for it. If you throw it on your resume, it looks good. Um, but it is a pretty advanced machine learning model. I just wanted to so show you guys that or mention it. Um, so you have kind of like a, a, a very introductory uh, concept or familiarization with what machine learning versus um, regular modeling, modeling would be. And again, if I can reiterate, regular modeling is like talking to a computer and um, machine learning is getting a computer to do the modeling for you. Um, so again, they're not, they're not better. One's not better than the other. Um, I think a lot of new advancements in technology have made it so that um, computers are better at modeling than they used to be. They used to be very bad. I will say 10 years ago, um, they would, would have been referred to as overfitting and no one would have trusted it. Um, but some of the underlying techniques um, have gotten a lot better. So um, that's my time. I'll pause if there are any questions. I know that was a lot and I don't expect anyone to have uh, remembered every single detail of that, but I'll just take two questions really quick if anyone has time. I have a question. Sure. So when, so when you went to go to school for mathematics and things like, um, and things like that, did you know that mathematics was going to be important for AI learning or that it was just going to be like a side thing? If I knew AI was going to be a thing, I would have invested in AI rather than go to school for math and statistics. So no, I did not, I was not blessed with that foresight. Shark's laughing at me, but, um, oh wow. I see the chat is full here. Uh, sorry. I did while well, I wasn't looking, but, um, I guess the question you're asking is like, why was I a math and stat major? Dude, I mean, you're giving me too much credit to think that I, I knew any of this ahead of time. I was just a kid who was bored by his business classes. And I actually liked math, as weird as I was to say. I, I don't know, I took it, two years of calculus before I got to college and I could have graduated uh, pretty easily as a math and stat major, so I did it. And I had a lot of options when I graduated, so I was really uh, grateful for that. Anyone else? Okay, cool. Good. Um, before we hand it over and let Ponch run, I, I think I just want to leave you with two thoughts on this for two kinds of people in this class. Um, I think, Pasha, once again, great, great lesson plan. Half of you or some of you might be inspired or might already have been inspired to maybe find a career in data science. Um, and I, I hope that you saw some things that he broke down in kind of just layman's terms that pushes you towards um, a passion for that. Uh, I think that would be amazing. And for the rest of you, this may be one of the only things uh, when you you become like a, you know, in the business world, full-fledged adult that you look back on and you actually remember about data science and statistics and, and this type of mathematics. And, and what I tell you in that is I hope, I hope some of the things that he hit upon the assumptions and the fact that um, these are not black box answers that get spit out. They are, helpful guardrails by which you can come to a conclusion is something that all of you, no matter what you do, are going to be served well by learning. I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing. I, it is a big part of every day of my life now. Um, and it's called correlation does not imply causation. And all the time, people show me in the various roles I have and, and positions I'm in data, trying to convince me to do something. And they'll show all kinds of stuff. And they'll say, this is why that's the answer. And if you don't learn early on that the simple fact, correlation does not imply causation. It's basically just because two trends seem to fluctuate in tandem, um, that rule is about not proving they are meaningfully related to each other necessarily. So there's this guy who does these hilarious graphs and things. He built this system. And I'm looking at a couple of them right now. It says um, the divorce rate in Maine um, in conjunction with the per capita consumption of margarine, right? There's correlation right there. 
per capita consumption of chicken and total U.S. crude oil imports. Definite correlation there. Per capita con uh, uh, consummation of sour cream and motorcycle riders killed in non-collision transport accidents. All of these things have correlation. Someone, they seem funny, but the broader point is causation is what you're ultimately looking for. So if you don't do anything with this space, remember this space will have touch points with you for the rest of your life. So you don't necessarily need to believe that a black box has spit out an answer for you. And it's that simple as you go perhaps into a business career or something else um, down the road. Remember how these models, how data science works and that'll serve you well. All right, I'll give you one more. Speaking of like um, things that are seemingly uncorrelated or maybe not as obviously correlated, a lot of you are either taking your SATs or have taken your SATs. Uh, I know I've bored Tark to death about this before, but um, basically every measurable data point suggests that your SAT score actually correlates more with your uh, median family household income than it does your uh, propensity to do well at college. So uh, it's really interesting where a lot of these colleges take the highest GPA, take the highest SAT score, but what they find is that the SAT score actually isn't in indicative of um, who you will be in five years, right? And it's weird because if you look at Bill Gates, like people still to this day tout like, oh yeah, he got a perfect SAT score. Who cares? Like that's not, that's not important. It's not indicative. Again, it's, it's just a point estimate that has nothing to do with your life. And it's probably more um, correlated with the type of home you came from than where you're going to go with the rest of your life. So that was just one thing that I thought was interesting too. Awesome. Well, Pasha, great, uh, great uh, lecture once again. I hope you guys got something out of that.